everyone, and welcome to a new episode of New Emotional Home. Today, I'm joined by Shweta. I'll edit this part. Shweta Jani, uh, who is a go-to-market expert for tech-enabled SaaS businesses, and she helps founders go from zero to one. And I've loved her work for so long, and I'm really happy to have her on. Thank you, Shweta. Thanks so much for having me, Sangeeta. I'm so excited to be here. I love your work, so this is really exciting. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I think um, we, we were talking about clients and, you know, do you find clients or do clients find you and lessons learned in the entrepreneurial process? So, uh, yeah, I'd love for us to start there. Yes, of course. Um, yes, yeah, so we were talking about this a little bit before before we hit record. And I think, honestly, I think it's been literally, you know, around the topic of sort of zero to one. Um well, first of all, zero to one, like tactically speaking, means so many different things. But I specifically focus on sort of the zero to getting to one million part. So very, very early, um, very much where, you know, all of us, you know, I'm I'm on that and that's on that journey myself as well. So, you know, this as an entrepreneur, like we're still discovering ourselves as entrepreneurs. And so um, that's the stage of founders that I work with. And there's a lot that's going on mentally. You know, I think a lot of times we're focused on kind of the money and the revenue and the number of customers and all that is important, but, oh, the mental work is so real. And it's also, we all know the stats, right? We know that the failure rates for businesses are so high. Um, so that personally for me has been really hard is how do I find clients who I think have a high chance of being successful because I alone can't help. They have to have that mental kind of work that needs to be done to be successful. That's been really, really hard. I think one of the hardest things that I learned and I'm still learning is I have had a few clients, you know, I've been, on, been in business about two years. And in that journey, I've had a few clients who came to me when I'm going to file under a little too late. And what I discovered was, and I, you know, they hadn't really externalized it yet. Um, but there were signs for it. Now, now I know this is they, I was the last person standing in between them shutting down their business. Right. And they really essentially wanted me to help save their business. You know, they had been working on their business for a couple of years. This has happened a few times now. They had been working on their business for a couple of years. They have a product. They've invested a lot of time and energy into it. Universe is telling them it's probably not going to work out. All the signs are there. When I come in, I essentially help them figure out all right, here's the investment it's going to take. They're, think about that mental work, right? You've put so much of yourself into that business. And now an expert is coming in and telling you, you still have a long way ahead of you. That's a tough pill to swallow. It is. It is. And I just so want to point out, <laughs> yes, uh, the the pull of trauma, right? And the pull of the thrill of rescuing. Um, I think a lot of us as entrepreneurs and women and women who have been habituated to take on more and be the pinch hitter and the firefighter, you know, whether we're entrepreneurs or we are working in corporate businesses, many of us get labeled as the firefighter, you know, and we thrive in that chaos, right? It's, it's the pull of trauma and the pull of that savior, you know, let me go and rescue you, right? It's like being rescued and or rescuing. And that, yeah. that pull is, is, is a lot. However, I think over a period of time, as our nervous systems here we're also able to kind of hold you know in, in this partnership there has to be some of me and some of you right I can't just swoop in and then you do nothing right it has to be both and I think it's a sign of, of and this is why I'm passionate about helping execs and entrepreneurs because so much of this is our patterns that our nervous systems need to go over. This particular one, right? This cry for help thing yes. is such an early imprint, okay, for us. And we either were also vocalizing to to be seen and, and, and be rescued, or when, when that signal cries on, there is a need to just swoop in and save. However, it's never at that stage, it's not support that they're looking for, but it's more rescuing, right? So while you can support, we can't rescue, right? And so, so many of my clients who are Indian origin, women CEOs and execs are stuck yeah. in this pattern because the pull of that trauma is so alluring, right? It's like, yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to wear my cape and let's go. Them. <laughs> 
Yes, yes. It's so yeah. true. And I think that's, it's so beautifully put and having to sort of look for, I love that. And I think I might actually, I might, I might borrow that from you. I'm going to have to start looking for, are they, are they looking to be rescued? And if so, it's, it's just not something I can do. Um, yeah, that's a really, that's going in my criteria for looking for clients. <laughs> Can I be a rescue, rescue mission? <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what? As we were talking, I was thinking about this, you know, the pattern where the company is going through the dogs and then they hire a woman to come and save, save it. And then she fails. And then they use it as evidence against why they shouldn't do DEI and then go back to status quo. It's the same thing, you know, and we get pulled into that, right? Because we're traditionally caretakers, we're rescuers, we take on what's not ours. And it's like, sure, give me the cape. And it's being set up to fail, right? Oh my gosh. So well put. So well put. Wow. Yes. I mean, that's been a journey and a half, right? And um, anytime somebody says you're the last resort, especially in what I do, right? Which is very, very sort of deep. And I can't be that. Right. Because one, I'm not a clinician in that sense. Right. And then to say that, hey, you know, if it's that, then I'm not this is not an emergency thing. Right. And so, you know, when some, you know, urgency, I get it. I'm all for it. But emergency is something different. Right. And I'm not the person for emergency. Urgency is fine. You know, that's good. Like, you know, I can work with and, you know, let's get, get going. You know, that's fine. But um you know, this thing of you're my last shot and, you know, stand and that's too much, right? And that is too much. And um, I think many of us, like in the caregiving professions or even in leadership, right? I think get attracted to roles like that, which sort of involves the, the rescuing or being rescued or both. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes, for sure. I think I think we all have to figure out what are the things that we can actually support with? As you said, I really like that. What's the transformation I can help you with? But in order to achieve that, what do you have to be bringing to the table? Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. And if you're in that rescue mindset, that's that's a, that's a deal breaker. We just won't achieve the transformation because you won't be able to do your part on that journey. That's right. Especially right. because of the work I do is all of my offers are largely, I take very few done for you things. I do mostly done with you. And that means I need them at the table doing the work. You know, I, yes. there's only so much mindset work I can help with. So only yes. so many talks I can give. <laughs> that's right. That's right. No, and I think as a coach, it's you are doing what you do best, which is the GTM and getting them from, you know, zero to one. But then this piece is so important, you know, so I talk to me about what the difference is, because clearly there are some founders who, who make that, right? Who, who get from zero to one and some that don't like, what's the mindset? What's the mindset difference? Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's such a good question. I think there's a few different things and I hadn't, I've been thinking about this for myself. It's the first time someone has asked me to, to verbalize it. So bear with me. So one of the things that stands out to me is knowing the journey that you're on. So I think some of a lot of the founders who I meet, especially the ones who are in this um, rescue mindset, they have certain cues. Um, actually, there are things that you may think are good, but they're not. So there are things like, I need to start this project right away. Oh, you, yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah. If there's the work that you are outsourcing, it's so mission critical to your business that it's going to fail if you don't start it tomorrow you're mismanaging your business. Yep. Yeah. I'm not the right person for that. Yeah. This is not emergency services, right? Yeah. It's like, Hey, no, can I have no, an emergency nobody is session doing with that. you? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a hard, that's a big one. Um, so understanding and I, and what I've realized that it comes from is this, that, that in itself is a problem, but that's a symptom, right? But that usually means there's a lack of understanding of the, what, zero to one actually means and the game that you're playing, the journey that you're on and understanding the milestones. So we, we insert this false sense of panic. It's panic. It's often panic. It's not even urgency. It's panic. It's panic because we think that if we just solve this thing, our business is going to be saved. That's just not how entrepreneurship works for any business whatsoever. Um, And it certainly does not work that way on the zero to one journey where, you know, the way that I explain go to market to, to people, and this may resonate with you is took me a long time to land here. 
is that it's kind of like solving a puzzle or a Rubik's cube or like a jigsaw puzzle, right? And you put all the puzzle pieces on the table and you have to try to find the corner pieces. And unlike a puzzle, when you can tell that it's a corner piece, entrepreneurship isn't so black and white. So we'll put the corner pieces on and the corner pieces are the business fundamentals. So things like who's our ICP, what customer segments are we focusing on? What is the right kind of value proposition, positioning, all of those things. And I'm not going to go into detail about that, but you find those main pieces and then you go out and you run what I call, you know, go to market micro tests to try to really invalidate, not validate, invalidate them because these are all hypotheses. And guess what? Majority of the time, we're not going to be right about all of that. And so the first go will probably lead to failure, quote unquote, and we have to build in the time to keep going. And so that's the big difference that I've noticed between founders who make it and don't is you've bought yourself time. You've bought yourself the energy and time to do this work, to build the routine, to do this over and over again until you figure it out. Yep. Because guess what? Even after you get to one, there's one to 10. Yes. So don't exhaust yourself. Don't burn out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. I think um, I resonate with a lot of what you're saying. I think the, fundamentally, I think if you grew up in a perfectionist situation, uh, there wasn't a lot of room for play. There wasn't a lot of room for rest. And there wasn't a lot of room for just spontaneity and play in general. Right. Yeah. And so, and so, the way it translates into entrepreneurship is, it's creativity, it's play. You know, it's being allowed to fail. It's, it's, you know, the households where it's like, oh, don't jump on the table. You know, jump on. You know, don't get on that table. You're gonna fall, and you're gonna, you know. And I, I feel like, you know, entrepreneurship is all about that. It's like, how high can I climb and jump without getting hurt? And you won't know unless you do that. Right. And so, you know, if you had a playground experience where you were allowed to do that within, you know, some limits yeah. of safety, of course. Um, so I think there's there's that inherent sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, wiring. I mean, people call it the growth mindset, right? I call it whatever. Yes. But I think that, you know, the tolerance for imperfection, the tolerance for failure, the tolerance for uh, just sort of falling flat on your face, I think, right? Um, so hard. I think, so hard. yeah, is that, a, is that a setting? Like, uh, you know, I can share my observations on that because I also work with execs and CEOs, but purely from a nervous system, this early attachment trauma yes. point of view. But I want to hear your thoughts because you work with them on, on the GTM side. Yes. Do you feel like that's a setting that just, it's a base setting that you come with? Or Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, this is such a good good observation because a lot of founders admit this to me that they were really scared to put out come up you know if you think about the corner let's just think about a chronological order right you come up with an idea and then you spend a bunch of time and money usually building this thing bringing this idea to life and then you go out and you try to quote unquote validate again that's that's part of the problem is validating. You're looking for validation. You should be looking for invalidation. That's like a big mindset. Yes, shift. I Because you're probably it. wrong. Oh my God, <laughs> no. I love it. Yes. Like it's, it's huge. I had to learn yes. the hard way too, right? It, and you you're know gonna, what? It's confirmation I, bias. Like we're just looking, like, that's wrong. You're going to hit a wall very soon. You look at a couple of customers who agree and then you're done, right? So you have to invalidate. That's hard. And that that chronological order is what's wrong. So we are somehow wired. I have no idea where, and I think you're naming it as this sort of perfectionism thing that's taught to us from through literal or you know non-verbal cues of like this is you need to be perfect. And many founders admitted this to me, but that's fully wrong. So what we need to do, right, is step one is you come up with an idea, go try to break it. Don't build anything. Literally, just just this week, you know, I heard about a founder who's building something. That sounds like it could be really valuable, but he's spent a year and a half. So one of his really good friends is telling me, can you talk to him? I've been telling him to talk to you. He spent a year and a half. He's not even tried to see, do anything to see if people even want this thing. And he spent a year and a half and a whole bunch of money and time. That's too much. That's too long. So I'm deeply biased towards saying, just try to go get a happy paying customer, as I call it as soon yep. as humanly possible. You come up with an idea. Your next step is, what can I try to sell? Yep. 
the closest thing to whatever your big lofty idea is, what can I try to sell? And the work we do together is just, let's go try to sell it. Because the only true validation, if you're looking for it, that people want your thing is that they pay for it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm nodding along Every vigorously, smoke. right? I, I, I really, oh God, if any of you are watching this, please take notes because this is gold. Whatever you're sharing is gold. And I'm going to add this perspective of why that's hard, right? Because one external validation from for validation's sake, right? Our entire markers of success are external focused. And so seeking that, right? And then if you have that um, a system that sort of, is more focused on that, then you could get into that trap. So invalidation, I love that. And then the second thing is the visibility of putting yourself out there, right? It is very hard, especially for um, the engineer to CEO or the lab to CEO um, to re or even like, you know, um, a therapist to CEO, whatever, right? I mean, if you're very passionate about, you know, what, yeah. you know, the work, right? It's very hard for you to think outside in, right? And so visibility is hard in general. And then if you add like, you know, the color of your skin or your gender or your immigration and the visa status and survival anxiety, all of those layers, right? Point is, it's very hard to actually get on the phone and make the first sale because it involves putting yourself out there and selling. And then also it can feel like they're rejecting you when they reject the idea, right? I mean, you take it really personally when you, when you, because you don't have a lot of practice with this playing, right? And, and that it's a numbers game. And, you know, you just, you know, and, and that's a big mindset shift, right? Because yeah. it's like, and, and, and if you hold, hold the idea too closely, it's your baby and it's somebody's calling your baby ugly, right? And you're not going to like it. Yes. Well, unlike a baby, you actually get to make this thing. So might as yeah. well get the feedback early and fix it. Yeah, that's true. Right? That, but that's what I'm saying, right? Don't hold it so close like a baby, right? Like think of it as a as an art project and not your baby. Right? Oh my God. It's so, it's so true. And I think I've read so many variations or heard so many variations of this from, from others as well, right? Is you're going to get that feedback, whether you like it or not at some point. You might as well create an environment for yourself as early as possible to actually get that and then incorporate it and adjust it, right? So you've probably heard this, right? In startup land or in entrepreneurial world, being directionally right is so deeply important. So don't focus on, don't try to get your product perfect. Don't try or so whatever your solution is. I say product, it could be tech or solution, doesn't yeah. matter. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Just focus on being directionally right as a business. Oh, I love it. I love the term and I've seen you talk about it and post about it. Directionally right. Oh, I love it. And you know, that's one of one of the founders that I, I follow. He he used to say that, hey, as long as you're making revenue, you can play. You can make these mistakes, right? And you can just figure it out. Right. And so yeah. he's like, hey, go try it out. As long as you're making revenue, right? You're bringing some kind of sales, you're bringing, you're directionally moving in the direction of, you know, you know, somebody wants to buy what you're selling and will pay money for it. Then, you know, you can experiment, right? You can, you can try and you can fail and there's, and, and the more revenue you make, the more, you know, <laughs> leeway there yeah. is, right? So, um, yeah, it, it's, and, so true. And, it's like, yeah. um, what's the casino like, right? Like you earn your right at the table. When you yes. have money, you can play. But so you have to prioritize revenue if you want to play. Like that's just how it oh, works. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think the biggest mindset shift is also to, my coach says, this is like, don't think like an engineer, like think as a CEO, right? And that's a big shift because it's like done is better than perfect. Done. I know this and I, and I work with this. And, you know, there are parts of the business where I get caught out like that, right? It's like, hold on, 80%, good. You know, anything more and you're tinkering with it maybe for very less returns, right? Like yeah. it doesn't have to be pixel perfect. And, you know, um, I think that's, that's a big like shift, I think, right? And I feel like, I, and you know this, like I think we're raising women globally and it's not even like culture specific but we're raising girls to be perfect and boys to be brave unconsciously oh, yes. and so that gets in the way of creating more girls and women who will take chances put themselves out there fall on their face you know and 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 just dare to do that I think there's a big I we I don't even think it's an ambition gap as much as I don't know there has to be a different word for it but um yeah I, I don't know 
I don't know. I want to hear from you on this because I mean, you, yeah. your own journey, but also like clients that you work with. Yeah, there's definitely a big difference, right? So at one point I was writing um, small checks for as an angel investor. I, I still do. I'm just in the middle of figuring out my my thesis though. And you can just tell the difference between the way there's a massive difference actually in the way women and men pitch huge difference. They'll look at the most common thing because I'm still, I was also investing in the early stages, but a little bit later um, than the stages that I, I work with founders at um, for my go-to-market work. So they had some traction is what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that concept of some traction, the same amount of traction will be t- that story of, Hey, we have, let's just say they have 10 customers. That story will get told completely differently by a man versus a woman. Then we'll yep. share it with an absurd amount of confidence. They will connect all these dots and talk about how this is, they feel confident. This is early signs for X, Y, and Z, how it connects to their big vision. Women will say, you know, we're just getting started. It's a little early and they're, they're softer. Their body language is closed off. It's such a big difference. And I'm not saying this is how it should be. I'm just saying this is just what I observed in the pitches that I listened to. And as an investor, it's hard for me to believe you if you don't believe in yourself. Oh, it breaks my heart. But oh my God, thank you so much for sharing that. I think, oh, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a woman entrepreneur, please, please, please take notes. I mean, this is this is gold. Yeah. Yeah, it's heartbreaking, and, and it's, you know? It is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. I was uh, working with like a CFO for like setting up my business today. And she was saying that um, I'm the only female founder that she's worked even in uh, startups that have a female founder. Uh, they do the, like the marketing stuff, whatever. They don't go into these financial conversations. And she's like, you're the best client I've ever had because you come prepared and you're responsive and you're professional and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh God, you know, it's really sad that there, is, there are so few women, right? And and yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a tough, it's a tough road. And I think so much of this is about us unlearning, right? Like recognizing and then unlearning so much of how we were trained to be, you know, mm-hmm. I, like I grew up in, in India when I was younger and I definitely, I mean, I, I love, I, I love my upbringing. I love my family and very close with them. Very grateful for everything that they've taught me, but there are certain aspects of what they unintentionally taught me because they thought it was best for me that I've had to unlearn, right? So yep. growing up, I've always been, I've always been a talker. And as you know, this, that is very frowned upon. So children yes. are always told, in general, children are always told, do as I say, why do you always argue? Why do you always have an opinion? Why can't you just do what I tell you to do? And it's even more so the case, women will get, girl, little girls will get told things like, What's going to happen when you have a husband? What kind of family is going to want to have have you as a daughter-in-law? You're always oh, questioning everything. Yes, exactly. What will your mother-in-law think of me? The amount of times I've heard that in my life. I don't even think my mom talked so much about the person, the, the, the hypothetical man that I was going to marry, right? As much as, oh my God, what will your mother-in-law say? And what will oh, the world say? God. What will, what will, yes. what will I what will the extended family say about how I've raised that's you? Right. And it's like, that's right. That's right. She does not do that any, anymore. She, she had to unlearn it all too, but it takes time, right? Yeah, yeah. And she was yes. what she thought was best for her daughter. Yeah, yeah. At the time, given what she was taught in that time. Yes, yes. But it's one of the hardest things, and this is, you know, what, why therapy is good, is learning to honor the best of what our parents and our families gave us and right. taking, taking what serves us but recognizing when something is not serving us and letting it go. That's right. right. That, I, that's exactly the work. Yeah, that's exactly my, like, that's my sort of thing. It's and, so and hard. It perfectly. It is hard because, you know, you have this amazing work ethic, you're a go-getter and, uh, you know, it served you well, right? And, and some of it, it has served me supremely well in this entrepreneurial journey. And there are other things that I've had to unlearn and it, it doesn't have to be anybody's fault, right? Because nope. see, for her, nope. it was, it, it, it genuinely was a uh, society where if you were visible, there was an immediate threat, right? Yep. And so you had to um, not stand out as a safety yeah. measure, right? And, yeah. and so, so many layers, I think for me, uh, the, the biggest piece 
for Indian first, like us, right? Um, who were born in India. Yeah, for our India, generation in and, particular. Uh, for our generation. Yeah. This is a huge thing that I mentally struggled with. And I think you'll resonate with this is growing up, I was told that I had to be financially independent at all costs. And my mom would always as an antidote to patriarchy, right? As, as um, yeah. you know, you can then have your own voice, right? So my mom would tell us, you oh, guys, you be financially independent and then you can have opinions, right? Like, you know, that sort of thing, right? Like you first, yes. you know, make your paycheck, leave this place and then, you know, so that was so ingrained in me. And I think that came in the way of, you know, um, I, I did love my corporate career and then, you know, didn't want to, yeah. you know, I, it wasn't serving me, but then that shift. And, and this is something I see in all the execs and CEOs that I work with is the comfort of that paycheck means financial independence means, um, so, you know, uh, protection against patriarchy, right. Ability to have your own opinions. And that yeah. is so ingrained in you. And even with an amazing partner who says, this is all our money and you have all the time in the world, go figure it out. You still feel like a burden, right. And in yeah. the zero to one journey, right. It's yeah. like, Oh my God, I don't know. And you know, that anxiety comes in the way of then calling you and saying, fix everything overnight. Right? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. You know what is really interesting to you is on the contrary, now that our generation is raising children, I just, oh my gosh, at least, I don't know if this is true everywhere, but at least in the US, there's a lot of little girls around me. I have two nieces and it's so fun to watch how much courage and bravery these girls have. Oh, they're, yeah. <laughs> they're can hold you on yes. ground. You know, I took my yeah. eight year old to the doctor's office. She had a sudden sort of thing that came up and I didn't even realize this was happening, but we're on the phone with her mom and dad as we're on the, on the drive over. And she's sort of asking questions and preparing. And I didn't know this. And I'm sort of preparing because I was just thrown into the situation and I'm trying to gather the data of what I might have to tell the doctor. We go into the office, she sits down and the, and the, it's a nurse practitioner and she goes, you know, tell me what's going on. I watched my eight-year-old niece handle that entire, entire session all by herself. I yep. had to do nothing. <laughs> yep. And I thought, wow, wow, that's, that's yep. the generation. That's, the, I wish I had oh, that. Oh my I God. I knew how to handle I, I, a doctor's yeah. office visit yeah, yeah, when I was eight. Yeah. I, I have a 10-year-old and an almost eight-year-old. Oh, they wa I mean, you just see her just like right now, you know, my best friend's boys are over for a sleepover and they're playing and she is, she's the boy, I mean, she takes charge, she will, oh, orchestrate everything and she'll be like, oh, oh my, my God. God, I'm like, yeah, you're gonna, like, I can't, honestly, right, I, I can't, I mean, okay, maybe I'm just being the, the proud mom, whatever, but neither of my girls I can see in, like, a nine to five job for long periods of time, right, like, they are just, they will go, go for it, and, and, and yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm so proud, I'm so excited. Yeah, yeah. To yeah my absolutely, no fear of calling, calling, calling out when things are not, you know, not right. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So yes, yes I'm, I'm very, very it. bullish on the future, right? So this is not about yes. like blame, shaming or victim. Or, yeah, but the, the context, right? I mean, I think in two generations, you know, we're all on this journey to sort of figure out and, you know, where we yes. stand and all of that. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> I'm so excited for the future. <laughs> yeah, me too. So I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask you. Um, sure. One is, uh, if you look back at your life, What's the one thing that like really lights you up and that you're very, very proud of? Um, I think I, okay. I did think about this one a bit and by far, I would say it would have to be me starting a business. It's yeah. freaking hard, but I think I'm dope. I, I think I'm going increasingly proud of having done this big, scary thing. The more I realize how hard it actually is. So it's proud in the moment I was, but I was probably more scared when yeah. it was happening. <laughs> Yes. But now I'm proud that I got through that mindset work that we've been talking about, right? I pushed myself and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try. Embarrassingly, it took me a, over a year to apply my own methodology to my business, which is like a big unlock, as it does with all of us. Applying things yes. to ourselves is always harder. Yes. Um, yep. Always to ourselves and to our businesses, always harder. Yes. Yep. And that's why 
just need coaches, mentors need mentors, right? Like that's the whole point. That's that's why that is therapists need therapists. Like that's that's why. Absolutely. But it's hard work. And I think that's it's just so it has changed the trajectory of my of my life. I call this my second career. Because up until then I had done the things that you do, you know, moving up up the ladder, all of that. And then I did a big pivot. I went and actually got my dream job in a different industry. So I did a big, big major shift, which was really cool. But I ended that with like absolute burnout absolute absolute deep burnout I I used to call it my crawling on the carpet phase because that's all I wanted to do like some for some reason the carpet seemed very tempting I just wanted to crawl up on the ground because I was so tired I was so burnt out and I had an amazing coach at the time she she specialized in transitions and she helped me realize you know like this voice has served you has given you everything it possibly could it's time to move on but it was my dream job. So it was so yes. hard to walk away. Absolutely. It was so hard to walk away. And so I think it's the the fact that what it what led up to me starting my business and then what I have learned about how hard it really is makes me like 10x more proud of having done that. Yes, I love it. Yes. And staying the course too, right? Like that's the, you know, it's not just starting up, it's also like Staying the course and, and, you know, all of the, the trajectory. Oh, yeah. I love it. Showing I up every it. single day, every morning. I was actually talking to an entrepreneur this week um, during one of our consultation calls. And I literally burst out laughing because what did they say? I've had heard multiple founders have said this to me. That, you know, they thought that entrepreneurship was going to be like, I'm going to have these 4 a.m. mornings. I'm going to be so busy. There's going to be so much work mm. to do. Like, mm. Actually, when you get started, entrepreneurship is waking up every morning and figuring out what to do and then doing that thing and then doing That's the same true. thing over again because there's literally no one telling you what to do. There's no, Correct. trust me, the entrepreneurship books are not useful. Like none of that helps. No, like, just, no none of that helps. No, every no. single day showing up and showing up on the days when you ran an experiment and it didn't go your way, like hardest days, hardest days. Agreed, agreed. And also, I think when you hit that uh, even key, it's actually logging off and saying, hey, you know, I actually don't have to work because I've delegated this to this person. I've deprioritized this. I've done everything of value. And I can, and that feels so weird some days, right? It's like, whoa, what? That's it? It's like, yeah. And, you know, just sort of stopping and taking those breaks because otherwise you're going to burn out. Oh, yeah. Burnout is so yeah. real. It's so real. And I think because I came from a place of burnout, that's something I'm so conscious of is I'm really building for longevity. I don't want to burn out. And I've also been very conscious of, I know what really fuels me is who I work with. So I pay yeah. very close attention to finding me the right too. people to work with, yes. the right partner with, the right people to get on yes. calls like this with, right? Yes. I just, yes. I'll say no more than I'll say yes. And that's, yes. that's not great for business, but it's good for business long-term. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And that's a skill, right? I mean, the no more no's you say, it uh, opens up for the right yeses to come through, right? Because otherwise you're oh, yeah. stuck in that cycle. And yeah, for sure. For sure. For ah, sure. Okay. One more question. Um, if yes. you could tell yourself some the you from five years ago something, what would that be? Okay. I have to think about exactly where I was about five years ago. But I think I would tell myself to look at the signs that are telling you that it's time to end the season in life oh, give yourself permission it. yeah right just just give yourself permission to move on there's something bigger and better waiting for you on the other side it will be hard but you'll be okay oh I love it thank you so much I think we'll, we'll this is a very beautiful place to end thank you so much Veta. It, was, it was a pleasure